Can you hear me? All right, we ready to go? Can you hear me okay? All right, let's get started. Give me a little volume. Are we good? Can you hear me okay? It just doesn't seem loud. Maybe it's just me. Can you hear me? All right, let's get started this evening, please. All right, let's take our Bibles and go to the book of Revelation, chapter 14. Revelation, chapter 14. Oh, I can speak up. I'm, that's not what you... Can you guys uh, give me a little bit more volume, please? Is that better? All right, Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation 14. You hear me okay? All right. Thank you all again, sir. All right, Revelation chapter 14. Is that better? Can you hear me? Now, last week, uh, Lord willing, we're going. <laughs> we have got about four weeks to try to finish this, which will be a miracle in itself. And uh, I'm going to try to do three chapters tonight. And uh, so we may have to run like a madman. But uh, so what I'm going to do is, we're, again, we're going to kind of hit some of the high spots, and then uh, I'm going to come back and do a slide presentation and kind of spend a long time kind of going through the overview of it. Now, last week we talked about we are probably in the latter half of the seven years. And uh, what is it? Okay. All right. Good. All right. I can't tell up here. All right. So you get you good to hear me. You hear me. Okay. All right. So we're probably in the latter half of the seven years of the tribulation. And, uh, and, and if you're thinking, why should we talk about these things? Well, I think it helps keep us a readiness to remember that we all need to be ready to meet the Lord at any time. And we also need to be uh, talking to other people about it as much as possible. Uh, The problem with our generation is this stuff has been pumped into movies so much, everybody's kind of numb to it. They're not scared. There was a time where people were really terrified when they watched horror movies. Now they can watch popcorn and drink a drink while somebody's being murdered right in front of them and it doesn't bother them anymore. That's the condition or the conditioning of our generation. So in Revelation chapter 14, we finished up 13 last week, and again, I told you there's no way to get into everything. Uh, So anyway, let's just read some verses and try to get right into it tonight. Revelation chapter 14, verse number 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their set. All right, so it's obviously evident, something uh, that people can see. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And we know who that is. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. And uh, this is just a little extra. I don't know if you've ever been around a harp before, but there's something different about the sounds that come out of a harp that's almost heavenly just listening to it. I think that's just interesting. Anyway, verse 3, And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins." These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now as we get into chapter 14, this gives us some detail about the 144,000. Now go back to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, and again, I want to highlight who these people are. 
Uh, and these are not people that go out on visitation who call themselves Jehovah Witnesses. Uh, we all should be witnesses for Jehovah, but we are not Jehovah Witnesses in that crowd. Uh, it's interesting, when their numbers grew, they had to change up things. They used to be not a... It's funny to me that uh, you have to change the what you teach because of the number of people that you have. Anyway, Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter number 7. Notice verse 3 again to highlight who these people are. Uh, Revelation 7 verse 3. Saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God. Where again? Say it. All right, good. And verse 4, And I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed a hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of who? Who? Israel. So this group of people are Jews. And then it gives you twelve thousand from Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, uh, uh, Naphtalim, Manasseh, uh, Simeon, verse 7, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And of course, when you go back, Dan is the one that's left out, and Manassas is in his place, which was the firstborn of Joseph. <clears throat> and then verse 9 talks about out of all nations. So there, there's, there's a distinction made of this 144,000. Now go back to Revelation chapter 14. <clears throat> now this scene, uh, I think that at times the Lord gives us what's going on down here, and then He gives us what's going on up there. And this scene in Revelation 14 is another view from heaven. Notice verse 3 at the end, they were redeemed from the earth. Does everybody see that? Then he, at the end of verse number 4, these were redeemed from among men being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. Now back to verse number 1, he said, And lo, I looked in, in uh, excuse me, and lo, a Lamb stood on Mount Zion, and uh, with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, this Mount Zion is not Mount Zion on the earth. This is Mount Zion in heaven. Remember, God has a pattern of things here that's up there. So when he made the tabernacle, you guys know this. He said, make this after the pattern that I've showed thee in the mount. So what's up there is made down here. And so this Mount Zion is in heaven. Now go back to Hebrews chapter number 12, and I'll show you the reference. Hebrews chapter number 12. <clears throat> now it would be different if the Jehovah Witnesses had their doctrine straight, but when you teach Jesus is a created God, then you're a heretic. That's as nice as I can say it. Hebrews chapter number 12. Hebrews chapter number 12. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter number 12, notice verse 22. Hebrews 12 in verse number 22. But ye are come unto the Mount Zion, notice how it's spelt again, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. You say, where is that? That's up there. It's reflected down here in a physical sense. Now go back to the book of uh, Psalms. Let me show it to you one more time. Psalms chapter number 48. Psalms chapter number 48. Now when I first got saved, uh, the Lord had me run into every crazy person under the sun, and I mean that with all my heart. From a Hindu in Alabama, if you can imagine such a thing, and uh, Jehovah Witness, Mormons, Methodists, everything you could think of. And, and, and uh, like I was teaching my boys... Uh, uh, every lie has some truth mixed in it. And when you take just a few verses out of the Bible and then you make all, you build all your religion on two or three verses, you've got to understand that you're going to get yourself way off really, really, really quick. And look, I may not can explain the Trinity. I may not can explain how God became a man. But the fact of the matter is, it's true whether I understand it or not. It's just that simple. God was manifest in the flesh, right? Justified in the Spirit. It is just the fact that that happened whether we understand it or not. So in talking to everybody, you'll, you'll figure out, once you start talking to people, you'll figure out that 90% of most religious people have some kind of uh, faith and work set up as far as being saved, and that's where they get off track in our day and time. Anyway, I don't know why I said all that, but look at Psalm chapter number 48. 
We're talking about Mount Zion. I guess I'm just talking about how they don't see the difference between the heavenly and the earthly. Uh, Psalm 48 verse 1, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. You say, where is that? That's up there. That's not down here. The rest of the chapter talks about the earthly Jerusalem, but there is also a heavenly Jerusalem. Now go back to uh, Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14. So this 144,000 has been redeemed from the earth. You sure? Okay. Stop. Any kind of stuff at church knows that somehow the devil gets involved in electricity. And if you don't know that, you ain't been around long. You can come to church and all the buttons be moved. You'll say, who's been up here? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, Revelation chapter 14. Can you hear me now? Yes. Revelation 14. All right. Back to Revelation chapter 14 and verse number 2. So this crowd has been uh, obviously sealed in their foreheads. And these are the 144,000, uh, 12,000 from each tribe. In my understanding, these are some that are going to be preaching along with angels and along with Moses and Elijah in the first three and a half years. Notice verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts. And I'll come back to this in just a second. Verse 4, uh, These are they that were not defiled with women, for they are what? Say it. Okay, so these are obviously men. I know the culture you live in, the culture means uh, everybody's whatever they want to be. In the Bible, it's male and female, just in case you wonder. And uh, I, know I won't get off on that, but the well, reason I'm, point I'm saying that, that these are men. Now listen closely. In my experience of witnessing the Jehovah Witness, there are not too many men. Now you've got men with the Mormons, but you don't have them with the with Jehovah Witness. It's interesting, you can find four women all the time knocking on doors, but you can't find no men. When the, anyway, it's just, I'm just trying to be careful. So what I'm saying is this, is that this 144,000 is not a group of people on this planet planning to be in Jehovah Witness going around spreading the kingdom. And if you're not part of their group, you're not going, you're not going to inherit the kingdom or you're not going to heaven. Let me just say this to you, uh, you Baptists. You're not going to heaven because you're a Baptist. You go to heaven because you're born again and you put your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Half the Baptist ain't got it right. And I'll get to that in just a few minutes. But what, I, what I'm saying is, is that when, when someone takes a, por a portion of Scripture and then they say, this is us and the rest of you have to be us, it's all a lie. Anyway, a half truth is still a whole lie. You agree? Amen. All right, so these are virgins, so they're all men. These are they which follow the Lamb. So they, they had the, uh, uh, verse 1, they had the Father's name written in their foreheads. And they follow the Lamb, verse number 4. They are the first fruits, amen. And uh, verse number 5, And in their mouth they was no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Um, Anyway, I, I'm, just, I'm just trying to be careful what I'm saying here. But uh, my, my thing is this, is that if you want to know how to spot a lie, you've got to know the truth first. Now, I don't know how it is here in Texas, because we have not been here long, but in the South, there is full of religious people that have information about everything. And what they do is they study all religions, and they pick out what they like, then they incorporate it. Now, listen to me closely. You can't spot an error unless you know what the truth is. So it's vital that you don't study religions and still you study the real thing. Anyway, that's extra. All right, verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel 
to preach unto them that dwelt on the earth and to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come. Worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Why is He saying this? Because of the contrast of those who worship the beast and His image. Go back to chapter 13, look at verse number 15, please. Chapter 13, verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as that would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor and free and bond, to receive and mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, to see, show what? Show a distinction is that we belong to the devil, these guys belong to God, so they're marked. And the difference is, if you're going to avoid the mark of the beast, you need to worship Him who made heaven and earth and the sea. Does everybody see the contrast? Verse 8, And they followed another angel, saying, Babylon has fallen and has fallen, that great city, because she had made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, this is a preview of what's going to happen in Revelation chapter number 18. It's almost as if the Lord's saying it, like it's almost happened already. Does everybody follow? Now we'll get into detail in Revelation 17 and 18 next week. And it'll probably be a little bit more than you're used to. I'll just say it that way. Verse 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receiving his, in, uh, re receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now, some of this stuff is just really not pleasant to talk about, but it has to be talked about. Now, in our generation, and this is, I want to just be as clear as I possibly can, hell is still a real place. Now, I don't care about talking about it. I don't think when we talk about it, we preach about it, we ought to not be glad people are going there. That ought to not be our spirit at all. I've heard preachers get up and preach about hell like they were glad the people were going. None of us should be glad of that. So the whole purpose of, uh, of emphasizing this thing again, it seems that once these people receive that mark, it seals their fate. And so that, it's almost as if that strong delusion that they should believe a lie is almost magnified there, and now they don't receive the truth, and so then they're deceived, and that's why they take the mark, and once they take it, they're damned. Now, let me just say this. If a person isn't saved from hell, what are they saved from? When's the last time you heard somebody preach a message on hell outside of this place? When I first got saved, they talked about it almost every week. Some of you don't even preach about it anymore. Some of you don't even talk about it when you witness. And you're saying, well, I, they, they, what are you going to do? Scare them into hell number two? Do you understand? It's a responsibility for us to talk about it. I don't care if the Jehovah Witnesses don't believe in it. I could care less. They're going to give an account to God just like you and I are. And look, it's not a pleasant thing. But I'll just illustrate it this way. It's one of my favorite stories. Years ago, it was a former, uh, I think he was an army guy. He said to us, he said he had a couple of soldiers ask the chaplain, and I don't remember how it was 40 or 50 years ago. These days, the chaplain, never mind, I don't even need to do that. I've got to be nice sometime. Amen? So he said, the soldiers said to the chaplain, they said, Chaplain, do you believe in hell? And then he started fumbling his words. He said, well, you know, we don't take all those passages literal. And then he starts justifying, and those soldiers said, stop right there. And they said to that chaplain, he said, if there is a hell, sir, you're a liar. He said, and if there ain't, we don't need you. Y'all need to let that sink in a little bit. If there is a hell and we or they are not telling, then we're liars. And if there ain't one, then there's no need for what we're doing. There ain't no in between. And notice, 
verse 11. Notice again, the torment is a day and night and forever and ever and ever. And I, uh, The Lord gave me something a couple years ago that I use when I'm witnessing, and I, and I, try, and I promise you I'm not this aggressive when I'm, when I'm, when I'm witnessing. Say, so why you do it now? Because you need to be woke up a little bit. Half of you are still asleep. Anyway. So what I say to him now, I said, have you ever considered that, that, it's, that it's okay to be wrong about certain things, but if you're wrong about this, forever is a long time to be wrong? That ain't nothing harsh about that. Look, if all what we're doing is not even true, then we've lived a good life. I've met some great people, and when we die, we're all in the ground, and that's all there is. But if we got it right, and we do, then this life is just the beginning of what's going to happen in the future. And that's why we need to be telling them. Someone said it this way. They said, why does people suffer forever? Well, maybe because who they sin against lives forever. Verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this part in just a minute and put this together with chapter 15. Anyway, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. You know why he emphasizes this part here? Is because those that keep the commandments and those that believe in Jesus are going to have to endure to the end, and because they don't take the mark, what they're going to have to do? They're going to have to die. Look back in chapter 13. Look at chapter 13 again. Notice verse 15. I emphasize something different. And he had power. This is the second beast giving, anyway. Life under the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be said. Uh, so we go back to Daniel chapter 3 for the illustration. He makes an image of himself of a man. You all, when you hear the sound of the music, and he gives this list. You will bow down and worship the image which I have set up. And if you don't worship the image, the image, the image, you shall be cast the same hour in the furnace. Right? So it's the same process. But in the book of Revelation, people lose their lives by doing what? Look at me. Beheading. Revelation chapter number 20. All right, now let's go back to verse number 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the... You know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to put this stuff aside. I think I'd do better without my notes anyway. All right, verse 14. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one set like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So he, this sickle is going to reach down in the earth, and it's going to pull some out. Watch. And then he says in verse 17, there's another angel that came out of the temple, which is in heaven and having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sickle, thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are full of ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God, and the winepress was trodden without the city, and the blood came out of the winepress, even under the horse's bridle, by the space of a thousand six hundred uh, furlongs. Now, this, uh, this passage is a reference to what we call the, the, look at chapter number 16, look at chapter 16 and verse number 16. Be easy to remember. 16, 16. And he gathered them together in a place and it called the Hebrew tongue, say the word Armageddon. This is the only time in our King James Bible that word is used, Armageddon. It's not the only time the place of Megiddo is mentioned, but it is the place of Armageddon. And we'll talk about that in detail when we get to Revelation chapter number 19. Now, 
So here's what I want to say. Go back to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter number 13. And I'll give you a little insight into this, uh, into some of these parables that relate to this thing about the sickle and the harvest and those being and the reapers. Matthew chapter number 13. This will give you a little bit better understanding of some of these parables that Jesus spoke of. I mean, uh, we can be honest and say some of these things we're still trying to figure out. Can y'all say amen? Uh, I don't think the Lord would show all, uh, show all of it to us right away. Uh, what we know already goes to our head already. You don't have to say amen. I'll say amen for you. Some of you know too much. And you don't do with half of what you know now. So in Revelation, in Matthew chapter number 13, this is the parable of the tares and the wheat. Does everybody follow? So when he gives the explanation for this, I want you to watch that what the Lord says at the end, uh, verse 30. Jesus is talking. Let both grow together until what? Say it. The harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, plural, gather ye together first the tares and and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So, anyway, I'll just throw this in and I'll read the other one. So at the end, this battle, and we'll, like I said, we'll cover it more, this battle in this Armageddon, as people mention, so these, uh, these people are first... Uh, Put in this wine press, and I don't know if you've ever seen uh, any old pictures. It says the blood came out. So this thing was like uh, I don't, I don't know how to explain it, but the larger ones would be like a concrete wall about this high, and it would be in a big circle, and it had outlets on the side and the bottom to where they could gather the the the, the fruit of it. And what they would do is they'd take those vines and put them inside, and then that guy would pull up his clothes like this, and then he would stamp around on those, those grapes like that, and it would push the, uh, the juice out. Does everybody follow? So when he's talking about putting these people in there, he's talking about casting the wicked into this wine press, and that's why the blood is on the Lord's garment in Revelation 19, is because he stamps those people so the blood flows up to the horse's bridle. First, they're going to be put, they're going to be trodden down, and then they're going to be taken and put in the fire. They're going to be trodden first, and then they're going to be taken, they're going to be tormented in the fire. Okay? So notice what he says again in verse number 30, Let both go together, the tares and the wheat, so that means that there are some are growing that look like they're the real thing. Anyway, let me just throw this in. Just make sure you're not a phony. Just make sure you're real. I'm just telling you. It's going to come out in the end, and that's not the time to make that decision. And let both grow together until the harvest, and in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, gather together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. The good seed into my barn, the bad seed in the fire. Does everybody follow that? Everybody follow that? All right, now, notice again, he gives a, uh, uh, another explanation. So I'm just kind of highlighting this for you so you'll understand. So when they ask him about this parable, they're having trouble understanding. Then he explains verse 37. He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the ch tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are what? Say it. Have you noticed how much, how much different it is by the time that we live and the time in the future? Just like the Old Testament was full of angels ministering, angels preaching, Angels carrying out messages and duties. So in the future, the angels are going to do the same thing in the future. What is God doing? He's giving everybody a chance. Everybody an opportunity. Even those who, I'm looking for miracles. I'm looking for signs. God says, here's your sign. And they're still not going to believe. 
Verse 40. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. The Son of Man shall send forth His angels. They shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Is that clear? Is that clear? Does that clear that up? Now notice another illustration the Lord gives in verse 47. Again, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So this is an illustration, right? Verse 49, So shall it be in the end of the world, the angels shall come forth, like the sickle, and sever the wicked from among the just, the good seed, the bad seed, the, t- the wheat and the tares, separate them, and they shall cast them into a furnace of fire, there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Those, those verses, along what we read in Revelation, ought to be clear. There's going to come a time where the Lord is going to sit down and He's going to pull those good ones out. He's going to take the bad ones, throw them into the wine press, and this is how you know it's a reference to people. He said the blood came out. If I remember correctly, Brother Gary, you can correct me. If I'm a, the horse's bridle, those of you, you know how high that is. It's got to be at least 150 miles long. That's a heap of blood. And according to that other verse, there's like 200 million soldiers. I don't know if y'all know this or not, there's only a little over 300 million in your country. That's why the birds are called for that sacrifice so they can eat up all that flesh and drink all that blood. Back to the book of Revelation. Now that last, I'm saving that, but you got that early, amen? All right, go back to Revelation chapter number 15. Revelation chapter number 15. Woo, I got to move. Revelation chapter number 15. Let me hit a couple of high spots and we'll move to uh, 16. Now, Revelation 15 verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous seven angels having the seven... What, what plagues are they? All right, so in the book of Revelation we have three sets of judgments. Seven seals, seven trumpets, now seven last plagues, sometimes called last, they're vials. they called in Revelation 16. So there's the last seven now notice, uh, anyway, we'll, uh, uh, the end of the verse, verse 1, For in them is filled up the wrath of God, almost as if the Lord is waiting till the end to pour it all out. Verse 2, And I saw as it were a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, over the image, over the mark, over the number of the names, stand on the sea of glass, having their harps of God. Uh, I perceive this is the same glass, sea of glass from Revelation 4 that's before the throne. They're now standing before the throne on the sea of glass. And this is just a little ad lib. The fire may be a reflection of the fire in his eyes off the glass. Verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Now take your Bible and go back to Exodus chapter number 15 for me right quick. Exodus chapter 15. I've got to get through this. Exodus chapter number 15. So one, you have Song of Moses, and then you have the Song of the Lamb. Look at Exodus 15. Tell me when you get there, say amen. amen. All right, good. So Israel has uh, just been delivered through the Red Sea. Pharaoh and him are chasing. Now watch what happens in chapter 15. Once they delivered, they sing. I said once they're delivered, they sing. Let me say it again. Once they're delivered, they sing. I wonder about some of God's people who don't ever sing. Verse 1, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. Notice this statement. 
the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Now who does that sound like? That sounds like that, red, that white horse rider in Revelation chapter number 6. Pharaoh on that horse, that's the type. See the picture? The Lord is my strength and song, and He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare Him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt Him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is His name. I tell me that ain't awesome. Now to go back to the book of Revelation, chapter number 5. So we have the song of Moses. Go to Revelation chapter 5. The song of Moses. And then you have the song of the Lamb. And once you get saved, your song ought to change. I remember when... Uh, uh, Fanny Crosby said they talked about her singing some songs she wouldn't sing for public that were just between her and the Lord. She said, uh, she said our, listen to me closely, she said our words should not change, so should the music. When you listen to so-called Christian music, I, I, knew I, would, I knew I'd get off on this. If you ever listen to music and you can't tell if they're talking about their girlfriend or God, you're listening to the wrong kind. You're welcome. Amen, brother. All these people get up. I'd like to thank God. You're a bunch of perverts. You're a bunch of drunks. You're a bunch of dopeheads. And then you're getting up there thanking God for your music. God ain't in your music. There's no difference between it. Never mind. Revelation chapter number 5, sorry. Revelation chapter number 5. There ought to be a difference in our music. There ought to be a difference in our words. There ought to be a different song in our heart. And if you're still singing some reprobate like uh, Hank Williams Jr., Heaven Ain't a Lot Like Dixie, you got the wrong song. Man. You uh, Southerners okay? Anyway, Revelation chapter 5. Man, Alabama and Georgia, a bunch of stinking reprobate rednecks who went around singing about Hank Williams Jr. and Jesus. I'm telling you, those two names don't go together. Revelation chapter number 5. The reason some of you are quiet is because you got some of that junk in your car right now. <laughs> hey, I could get off on it. I really could. Revelation chapter number 5. You realize the devil was the uh, choir director and the musician, right? Revelation 5, verse number 9. They sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book. And to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. Are you redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Yes. Then your song ought to be different. Yes. Now, go back to Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter number 14. I uh, was playing in a band when I got saved. And the Lord had not saved me. There's no telling where I'd be. I can remember. I can remember trying to take world's music and trying to put Christian words to it, just so I could have the best of both worlds. And the Lord said, "This don't work. There needs to be a difference." Anyway, Revelation chapter 14. Now, none of this is in. See, I don't have my notes anymore, so you can't blame my notes. Revelation chapter number 14. And notice the Song of Moses versus the Song of the Lamb. So I'm going to put this together for you. Notice verse 12, Revelation 14, verse number 12. Here is the patience of the saints. These are they that keep the commandments of God. These guys keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus Christ. And that's why they can sing these new songs. These guys know Moses and these guys know the Lamb. That's why they sing about it. Amen? I think that's pretty good. Verse, let's see here. Let me see. Yeah, let's just. Uh, verse 4. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Well, most of the world. For thou only art holy, and all nations shall come and worship before thee. That'll be a future reference. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple 
of the tabernacle, the testimony in heaven, was open. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, having their breasts girded with a golden girdles. Anyway, I'm going to skip those last two if you don't mind and get into chapter 16. All right, so we're doing good so far. So in Revelation chapter number 16, chapter 15 is kind of the prelude of uh, the seven angels pouring out the seven last plagues. And then these are given in detail in this chapter. Now, the reason I went ahead and wrote them out is because I knew it would be easier for you to see. So I'm just going to highlight, then explain, then we'll come back if we got some time. All right, notice verse 1. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And just in case you're wondering if we're going to be there, God has not pointed us to wrath, but attain our salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody follow. Look, when we got saved, and I, y'all, I just love just getting all this good stuff in here. When we got saved, see, when God Almighty poured out His wrath upon His Son, Jesus Christ, He said, I have laid on Him the iniquity of us all. When you and I believed in Jesus Christ, that wrath passed from us. He that believeth not, the wrath of God abideth on him. But when I believed on Jesus Christ, that wrath transferred to here. And that debt is paid in full. Help me. So now God has not appointed us to wrath. If I got in a car, I couldn't drive to hell right now if I wanted to. Before I got there, somebody would be standing in the way with wounds in his hands and wounds in his side going, hey, I've already paid for this trip, amen. Man, that felt good. So. Now, look at, uh, man, where did all that come from? Oh, the wrath of God. I knew it was in there somewhere, amen. All right, verse 2. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore Upon the men which had what? Say it. The mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. Notice verse 3. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea. And the sea became blood. So that's what's left of the sea. Are you paying attention? What's left of the sea? You say, what do you mean? Because in Revelation 8, when we had the seven trumpets, remember, they poured out on the third of the waters. Okay, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add a little bit. When you get over here to the Euphrates, number six, the Euphrates course is drying up now. They think we're in the tribulation and they're smoking whatever, but we're not there yet. The reason the river has dried up completely, there has been no rain for three and a half years. That's why there's a great heat. Anyway. So number two is upon the sea. It became blood. Verse four, the third angel pointed out on the fountains of waters. Remember, it was a third of the fountains of waters, Revelation. So what's left? So you're going to have to buy and sell even to get water. You know, like you're doing now. Who would ever thought at the time you'd have to buy water to drink? I, I don't know if y'all are getting what I'm saying. You understand, you're setting up the world to have to have, you don't have no water, you're not alive. So you're buying it, conditioning, getting you ready. Anyway. So, verse 4 is, On the fountains of waters they became blood. Verse number 5, In the angel of the waters, thou art righteous. He praises the Lord for His judgment, what He's passing out. Thou art worthy, verse number 7, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. I don't know if you ever remember reading the account in Luke chapter number 16 when that rich man went to hell. You know, he asked for several things, but he never asked to get out. He never asked, why am I here? He never asked, why, why am I being punished? He never asked to get out. Because God's righteous judgment is true and righteous. He gave him an opportunity to repent, and he did not repent, and that was the end. Verse 8, And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. Verse 9, And men were scorched with a great heat. There's your global warning. You're welcome. It's going to be bad. 
I mean, it's going to be really bad. And I don't know if you've ever been burnt in any way or not, but can you imagine dealing with that pain forever? Notice verse number 9 at the end. They blaspheme God. Somehow it's had power of His plagues, and they repented not to give Him glory. Because you know what we read? We read, fear God and give glory to Him that made heaven and earth. See, that, they're supposed to give glory. When it all happens, they're going to say, God, they're supposed to say, God, You are right and just for everything You're doing. We deserve everything. That's what they're supposed to be doing. And they didn't repent. Verse 10, The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast. So this is obviously the latter half of the tribulation. Well, I'll hold your place and go back to 13. Hold your place and come back to 13, verse 2. His seat. Doing good on time. Look at chapter 13, verse number 2. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and like a bear, and like a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. I go back to chapter 16. So that vial was poured upon the seat of the beast. And in his kingdom was full of darkness, because he is the prince of darkness. They gnawed their tongues for pain, blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores. They repented not of their deeds. I don't know if y'all are reading this or not, but it's getting pretty bad. And all I'm trying to say is don't let anybody say you're a doomsday person. And you're gloom and doom. I promise you now, it would be better if somebody were mad at you now than mad at you later. Verse 12. So we went through 5. Notice verse 12. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates. And Euphrates is a long river. And that thing runs from the top of that area, all, from all the way in Turkey, runs all the way down into the Persian Gulf. I know some of you guys have been there in the services. You know how long that thing is? And how it dries up. And then all this conspiracy stuff going on. And these guys don't have anything else to say. So they get on this bandwagon about the Euphrates drying up. I'm just telling you. It ain't the time yet. All this is prelude stuff. And you don't even know half that stuff you're watching is even true or not. All these voices. I, that's the, all that stuff's a scam. Anyway. Verse 12. And the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And of course, that'll be a relation to China and different stuff like that. We'll try our best to get that in later. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And we call this the unholy trinity. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Again, that's a reference to Armageddon in verse 16. And the seventh angel, verse 17, poured out his vial into the air, which is interesting. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven and from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, thunders, lightnings. There was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great. If I remember correctly, this last earthquake, where was it at again? I forgot. Sir? In Turkey? As far as I know, there were over 30,000 people uh, that had already died. And look, when you watch some of the videos, people are filming, people are walking down the road, and buildings are going down right in front of them. It's the craziest thing, thing you've ever seen. But this earthquake is not going to be localized. It's going to be globalized. Verse number... 19, the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came into remembrance before God, and we'll cover that again in chapter 18, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of His wrath. Uh, the reason the word cup is used is because the Lord's going to make them drink it. Remember when Israel sinned against God, and they made that golden calf? You know what He did? He ground that thing up into powder, and He made them drink it. That's what God's going to do. Verse 20, And every island fled away. You mean an earthquake so big, all the islands? Hawaii? All those islands in the Philippines? All those people? Say, so why do you support missionaries? 
Somebody has to go. Somebody has to tell them. That's why we do this. Every island fled away, an earthquake so bad. You realize when an earthquake's that bad, you realize how high the water's going to be? And the mountains were not found. It's going to shake all the mountains so bad. You realize some of the mountains in your country is over 14,000 feet. Can you imagine an earthquake so strong that it shakes those mountains down to the size of this floor? And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail for the plague thereof was exceeding great. Notice how the word great is used. Verse number 9, great heat. Verse 14, great day. Verse 18, great earthquake. Verse 19, great city. Verse 21, great hail out of heaven. The stone about the weight of a talent. And if I have my numbers right, it's about 80 pounds. You know what kind of damage it's going to do to something coming out of heaven that weighs 80 pounds? Now I'm going to finish up with this tonight. What I want us to do is when we look at this and when we study this, I want us to realize the gravity of how bad things are really going to be. And this is not even the worst part. You say, my God, Freddie, this is so bad. But this is not even the end for them. Let me ask you again. You got, you got family that are lost? You got friends that are lost? You got acquaintances that are lost? And I know some of you are, are scared to death to witness them. Family is the hardest people to talk to. No doubt about it. If you don't think it is, try it. That's why we have gospel tracts. Uh, Brother Gary, you were not here the other day when they brought the gospel tracts, were you? You were not here. You were not here when you, they brought the gospel tracks the other day, were you? No. Tell how, let me tell you what kind of sense of humor the Lord has. So we're standing outside, me and Brother Brett and Brother James. Who else was out here with us? Do you remember? Michael was here. So this guy pulls up in a FedEx truck, and uh, he asks us where to park. We parked him right out front. And uh, this guy opens the door, and he goes... And I guess he had saw the, uh, the stamp on it or something. He goes, are these chick tracks? And I went, oh man, we got us a believer. This guy knows all about chick tracks. So I asked the guy, was he a Christian? He goes, no, I'm a heathen. Yeah. <laughs> I went, well, I'm a reformed heathen. <laughs> well, that was good off the hip, wasn't it? Yeah. So this guy, this is so intriguing to me. He gets out. Wants to know where to take them. He brings them all the way into the building, down the hall. Then he starts helping us unload them. I'm like, I'm standing there watching this going, man, this guy, he's captivated by this. You know you've been around people who want to get away from you as quick as they But this guy just kept hanging around. I'm like, well, I'm just waiting for my opportunity. So I kind of hit him up a little bit. So we walk back outside. Oh, man, this is so good. So I start talking to him. So I ask him, I said, how is it that you have a knowledge of this, but you don't know him? He said something to me about the crucifixion. He said, isn't that in Psalm 21? I said, well, it's actually Psalm 22. He goes, yeah, yeah, I knew it was closer there. I'm like, how does this guy know all this detail and he's not saved? He was very pleasant to talk to. He was very cordial. I said, Austin, I said, I said, just think about this. You delivered something that could deliver you. And inside I'm going, man, Lord, that was good. <laughs> I ain't that smart. So I gave him my testimony. And I said, you know what? Forever's a long time to be wrong. He thanked me, shook my hand. He goes, you know what? I've never even read on one of these all the way through. I said, well, he goes, you're going to give me one, ain't you? <laughs> I said, man, you're getting, you're getting with this good. 
So I'm going to say this. We've got 50,000 tracts. You say, who's going to give them out? You are. Lucas, you are. Some of you are scared to death. But you know what you do? You go in the bathroom and you go into a restaurant. And you sneak in there. And I don't care if you're scared to death. Wait till everybody leaves and put them everywhere. I'm standing in line paying my I put one right there. You say, why? Because people are going to look at them. They're going to go, what in the world is that? I'm telling you, adults read these cartoon tracks. They're nicely done. They're attractive. And I'm just telling you, just put them everywhere. If I knew I could get away with it, I'd just drive down the city and just throw them out the window. But I don't want to waste them. I tell you, I'll, give you, I'll give you one of my favorite favorite illustrations of one of my stories we when the olympics happened in 1996 uh, they had the olympics in atlanta if you guys remember well that whole world thing came into atlanta they remodeled all the houses around on the sides where you could see we gave out 30,000 tracks every night The road was wider than this building, and for three and a half, four hours, people this close, Brother Mike, just coming by us, I mean, just, I mean, preaching, giving out as many, I mean, it was, I've never seen a sea of people for three and a half hours. Over 50,000 people walked by us in three and a half hours. Did it every night, leaving the Olympics. When we ran out of tracks, I remember standing in the middle of the road, holding the sign up like this, and they were so crowded, people were bumping my arms. And you say, Brother Freddie, this doesn't work. Listen to me. You can't get seed out of the ground. You can't get something out that you've never sowed. Some of you are praying for a harvest. Some of you are praying for your family to get saved. You've got to sow it. You've got to give it out. The seed in there, you know what this is? This is the barn. You've got to get the seed out of the barn. I challenge you. If you have a hard time witnessing to your family, when you go to their house, leave one in the bathroom. Everybody's going to read something in the bathroom. I have a friend in Georgia. He has a, he has a porta potty ministry. <laughs> hey, I'm just telling you, this is revolutionary. I'm just telling you. So here, here's how you know something. So you put, you put a different track every couple of days. Now look, you know how long it takes to go to the bathroom. But when you realize you're washing your clock, you see them go into Port of John, you say, well, they'll be out in like 60 seconds, maybe 40 seconds. And when they go in there and stay for three or four or five minutes, that's just enough time to read a track. And look, you put the track in a certain direction so you know when they picked it up. Because they're not going to remember where it was, how it was stationed in there. I do it all the time. It's crazy. And then next week you'll put in another one. You put it, you fold it, you put it upside down. You say, why? Because when they pick it up, they'll put it back. They won't pay no attention to how they got it. I'm just telling you, it works. And you're not going to know it works unless you. I'm going to say this before we get done. If you're sitting in here tonight and you're lost, please make sure you're not putting on a show and you're riding off of mom and daddy's salvation, you better make sure that you're ready to go in case this could happen at any time. I don't want you to come back on Sunday and there'd be two or three cars here and everybody else is gone. And I'm being dead serious. I don't want nobody left behind. Not on my watch. Are you ready? Are you trying to give out tracks? I know it's hard for some of you to talk. I mean, as, as much as some of y'all talk, <laughs> man, you ought to use that gift for God. Anyway, I'm, I'm on, i got to stop. Jeremiah, you got something? All right, let's, have you, let's all stand. Thank y'all for your patience with me. I'm sorry I got rattling. I still got three minutes. How about that? Brother Eric is making his way. That means my cue, I am done. Thank y'all for your time tonight. Appreciate it. Cut this off, Brother Matt. All right. Well, he'll play something, sing, and uh, if you want to come to the altar, you can certainly come and pray uh, tonight. I'll give you that opportunity. You can come now if you want to come.